Project of GPs and Leukaemia Care um, Joint Initiative. Um, it's a webinar on acute leukaemia and blood cancer early diagnosis, which has been organised by Nick York, who's the Patient Advocacy Healthcare Liaison Officer from Leukaemia Care. So thank you very much, Nick, for organising that. And with um, the Royal College of GPs, North East Faculty and South West Faculty as well. So welcome, everyone. We've got about 190 of you registered, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all for putting yourselves on mute when you join. Please do keep yourselves on mute throughout the um, presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, please do use the chat function. Hopefully you can all see the chat function. It uh, should be down at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. Um, perhaps you could all start by introducing yourselves in there. So um, just letting me know what your name is, um, where you're from and what your role is. And before I forget, please, can you all also message Claire Bartram if your name is not obvious, so some people have strange Zoom names like iPad 2 and that sort of thing. Um, if that's the case, we won't know who you are to send you your CPD um, email afterwards. So please do message Claire, Claire Bartram privately with your name. So I'm Lily Lamb. I'm the chair of the Royal College of GPs North East faculty and really delighted to welcome you all along today. So we have a fantastic panel of speakers um, who I'll introduce separately before their each, um, each talk. Um, but welcome to, to Charlotte, Dr. Charlotte Martin, Dr. Richard Roop, Dr. Amit Patel and Dr. Barbara Compatis, who um, are all joining us today. Um, so this is Design, this webinar is designed to empower clinicians working in primary care um, to recognise the symptoms of um, blood cancer, to, to become up to date with, with referral pathways and to be able to communicate effectively with patients suffering from these conditions. Um, it, we find it best if you um, keep your, your Zoom on speaker view um, rather than gallery view so that you can see who's talking. There will be slides um, slideshow and also during the presentation. Um, we're going to do a Q&A section at the end rather than after each section, just because you may well find that some of your questions are answered by subsequent speakers. But please do put all questions in the chat and I will field them at the end. Um, the resources that are mentioned, Charlotte's gonna mention several resources. Um, they will be circulated via email by Claire as well. Oh, and finally, the webinar will be recorded. So hopefully at some point in the future, um, these, the recording will be available on the Royal College of GPs website for those who want to rewatch it or who can't attend. Um, so I think that's all of the main points. But finally, just a, a big thank you to Claire, Claire Bartram as well, who has um, assisted with organising tonight. She is our administrator for the Northeast faculty but is covering lots of other faculties as well at the moment and does a, a great job so thank you Claire and um, so I think that was all of the housekeeping points and um, so um, oh no one more thing I forgot to mention poll at the end so feedback poll um, when the last speaker has has finished there should be a poll that appeal, appears which you'll be able to just give very brief feedback rather than circulating an email at the end okay so um, Charlotte is up first. So Charlotte Martin is the Patient Advocacy Manager for Leukemia Care. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Lily. I'm just going to share my screen so everyone can see my slides. Someone could give me a heads up when you can see it. That would be fantastic. Okay, we should be on the first slide now. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce where the Spot Leukemia campaign came from, essentially the evidence behind it um, and why we started it in the first place. But of course, first, um, I'd like to introduce the charity itself. Some of you may not have heard of us. Uh, so we are a support charity. Uh, we were registered in 1969, so we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year, which was great. It was initially a charity supporting parents of children with leukaemia, um, but we now actually support anyone affected um, by a blood cancer, and that extends to family, friends, etc., um, as well as the actual person who has been diagnosed. Uh, our services include a, a range of things you'd probably expect from a support charity um, but I just wanted to emphasize that as well as us waiting for patients to come and 
um, access our services, we also actively promote those services, uh, in particular by recruiting um, staff such as hospital support workers, which um, have unfortunately had to stop their work due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we hope to have those up and running again soon. And of course, we participate and uh, organise healthcare professional education for GPs, but also ongoing education for uh, haematology nurses and engage with uh, haematology consultants too. And then specifically within my team, um, we do a lot of work one on one with patients in the advocacy uh, department, um, supporting patients with a variety of issues that they may face, uh, for example, financial issues, um, understanding information they come across on the internet, um, things like access to treatments that aren't available on, on the NHS and um, uh, understanding how the NHS works and where they can get support. But we also feel it's really important to support charity to raise awareness of issues that patients face on a much wider scale as well um, and try to make change on a broader level. And here's just a couple of examples of um, how we have done this work um, by engaging with haematologists at um, conferences, uh, one presented at the British Society of Haematology and one presented at the European Haematology Association <laughs> conferences last year. And this leads me on to our survey. Uh, so our survey is a big part of this work. Um, it enables us to, to identify those issues, as I'll explain later. The first iteration of the survey was done um, in 2016 and the end of results announced in 2017. And the second and second and most recent in 2017, results announced in 2018. Unfortunately, it's been on hold since then for various reasons, and we hope to run another version in 2021. And the aims of the survey were the various aims, but the most important are the two at the bottom there uh, are to identify areas that patients need support but didn't get that support and identify where they're already reaching out for support and to seek further help. And I thought it was important just to, for a bit of context is to mention the cohorts that, of patients that we recruited for this survey. Um, as you can see, there are three cohorts there. The first one, um, we uh, arranged an agreement to follow up on the cancer patient experience survey. So we contacted every blood cancer patient who had responded to that and many came back to us. We also contacted uh, a bunch of people from our own database and we contacted an anonymous group. And this allowed us to contact people who perhaps hadn't heard of us before and also those who had. Um, creating sort of a diversity among the people who were responding. So we knew that the issues people faced were probably common to all patients and not just ones that already engaged with us, for example. And this is just to illustrate that we had really, really good responses to the survey. Um, the majority of respondents were CLL patients, so chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients, which we will discuss in another webinar uh, later in the year. But um, as you can see from, from the numbers, uh, the acute leukaemia respondents were also very high for a survey of this kind. So what does all this mean for the spot leukaemia campaign? So the first and I'd say most important recommendation for, for this work is um, that we identified that there is a need for improved awareness of the signs and symptoms of leukaemia, importantly both among the public and among, among healthcare professionals. And I'm going to present a little bit of data very quickly to explain where we, how we came to that recommendation. But first, a bit of background of other data in this area. So we're not asking for an awareness campaign. There are many cancer awareness campaigns. What we're asking for is an early diagnosis campaign here. And this is because emergency presentation has a significant impact on survival at both the one month milestone and a 12 month milestone for all leukemia types. And if you look at the National Cancer Intelligence Network Roots to Diagnosis Report, uh, you can see that as you get into more specific types of leukemia, the incidence of emergency presentation increases. So they're uh, up to uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which actually has the highest rate of emergency presentation of all leukemia types. So clearly emergency presentation um, which is associated with late diagnosis, of course, is, is an issue specifically for acute leukemias. So what did we find in the survey that might explain why there's a high rate of emergency presentation? 
we found that leukemia as a term is well known. So people have heard of the word leukemia, but not many people actually know what leukemia is or who it affects. And they're also not aware of the symptoms that could indicate a potential leukemia. So only 4% of those experiencing symptoms and seven, uh, expected a cancer diagnosis and only 17% suspected cancer. And that's all cancer types, that's not even just leukemia. So the, the, these, the symptoms that they were experiencing aren't linked. And this was also corroborated by a YouGov poll we conducted just a couple of weeks ago. 97% of people have heard of leukemia and know it's a blood cancer. But prior to asking them whether they knew what leukemia was, we asked them whether they would seek help for a variety of symptoms. And the ones most associated with leukemia, they wouldn't seek help. We were talking about 25% of people to up to 45% of people, depending on the symptom, didn't seek help. So clearly there's an issue with the public. Even if they don't know where and are aware of what leukemia is, they're not going to the GP with the symptoms that could indicate leukemia. And therefore, that's a, a need there. And this is borne out in the patient de delay data. I won't labour on this point. But as you can see, there's still a fairly significant proportion of patients waiting a, a, a long period of time over a month to see before they see their GP with these symptoms. But we also found there was a, a, an issue from uh, in terms of the GP delay as well. Um, so in our survey, a third of people will experience multiple GP conversation con consultations. Sorry, but a quarter have three or more. Now there may be perfectly good reasons for multiple consultations. We recognize that. So we've looked into this a little bit deeper and a paper by Abel et al, it, Abel et al sorry, in the BJGP in 2017. So showed, look, it did a comparison of um, the cancer patient experience data I mentioned earlier and um, the NCIN report I also mentioned earlier. And it found that two thirds of emergency presentation two thirds of those presenting as an emergency have had a prior GP consultation, but only a third of them were referred to A&E by their GP. So there's a remaining third of patients who have seen their GP, but haven't had that urgent referral that they may need for acute leukemia. So we recognise there is still a gap here. And it's important to say this is not about blaming you guys as GPs. We totally recognise that there are challenges facing GPs and I can assure you that we're working on those in the background and we work really hard on those sort of policy issues to make sure that our work here today is supported by the support you need elsewhere that allows you to participate in this sort of work. But our evidence showed that a two-pronged attack is needed in order to improve early diagnosis we need both a public facing and a GP facing campaign to solve this problem. And so we came up with spot leukemia. Um, it was invented before I came to the charity, so I can't claim ownership of it. But I have to say it's a, it's a really great concept in terms of making sure we do do those two uh, prongs to the attack um, and to, to improve um, on the early diagnosis rate. So the key messages of the campaign are one, leukemia is a blood cancer. Two, it can affect people of all ages. I think the most common misconception we hear about leukemia is that people think it's a childhood cancer. Leukemia is the most common cancer diagnosed in children, but leukemia is most commonly diagnosed in those over the age of 65. So it's actually a, a, a cancer of older people, as with most other cancers. And we then identified the six most common symptoms reported by patients and turned that into a very specific campaign to try and raise awareness of the symptoms, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, the, excuse me. So there's two actions for each audience from this. The one for the public is to contact a GP and request a blood test to see if your symptoms are linked to leukemia. Highly likely that they're not. We do put that message out but a blood test is all that's needed to rule out leukemia. The second action is for GPs, and hopefully that's the message you will get today, is if you, suspect, if you suspect blood cancer, do a blood test. That is all that's needed to rule out leukemia. It may be something more benign that you may also pick up on the blood test, um, and that's the simple message, really. Here's just a picture of our uh, spot leukemia symptoms. Um, the six main symptoms we identified are on screen. 
Um, and those were the six most commonly reported symptoms across all um, four main leukemia types. An important part of how we raise awareness with the public, I just wanted to point out, is our patient stories. Um, we tell both stories where patients have struggled to get a diagnosis, but also the stories of patients who haven't struggled to get a diagnosis, have been lucky and have had an early diagnosis. And I think that tells the story from both perspectives really well. I think it's important to tell both sides of the story to make sure people are aware of how things can go if an early diagnosis does, does occur. And then I come to our primary care campaign. So obviously, we, uh, the change to webinars is obvious. You guys have joined us here today and we thank you for taking the time to, to listen to us speak about leukaemia. We are more than aware that leukaemia is a rare cancer um, and most GPs will only see one case every three to four years. Um, but by coming today, hopefully when that one person comes through the door, you will recognise them. Um, and just to say, we also have online modules that you can take. Um, the, our RCGP ones, there is currently a blood cancer general one on the website, um, but we are launching leukemia specific ones, um, hopefully by the end of this month and the details will follow. Um, and we also run them with uh, Gateway C as well. We actually have a general leukemia awareness course, which may be useful for pharmacists, opticians, any other healthcare professional who may not be as often involved in the diagnosis of leukemia, but may also want to improve their knowledge of the disease. And I think I'll stop there. I do have a few other slides, but um, I think I've come to my allotted time. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That no was problem. really fascinating and, and very, very, you know, excellent campaign, very clear message. So um, I hope that is successful in improving diagnosis. I'm sure people have questions for Charlotte, but if you wouldn't mind, you know, pop them in the chat by all means now while they're fresh in your mind, but, but we'll, we'll come to those at the end in the, in the question and answer panel, if that's okay. Um, so next we have the consultant haematologist perspective. So Dr. Amit Patel is joining us. He is a consultant in, he's got a very long title, consultant in cellular therapies and stem cell, cell transplantation, haematology, oncology, and intensive care medicine at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Amit, over to you. Amit, you're on mute. Yes, uh, sorry. Um, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to this excellent campaign uh, for helping to spot leukemia um, in general practice. And, and we've seen some of the symptoms outlined uh, by Charlotte just a moment ago as part of the campaign. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One is the burden of disease that we've got in the UK. Uh, and then some of the advances in therapy options available to patients. Um, and that sort of underlines why early diagnosis would be very important in those patient groups. Um, some of the precursor lesions to acute leukemia. And then I'm going to give a couple of examples of abnormal blood counts that may uh, aid in the diagnosis of acute leukemia and maybe help differentiate that from other causes. So the, the problem we're dealing with in the UK is that our survival for cancer overall is 50%, which does lag some of the other Northern and Central European countries, as you can see here. Um, and if you look at acute uh, sorry, leukemia... just to let you know, we can't see your slides. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, this did work a moment ago, didn't it? Mm. Uh, let's try again. Right. There we go. That I can see. That. Does that work? Yeah. And then you've got the slideshow there. Does that work? Yeah. So um, I'm going to spend uh, most of the allocated time talking about uh, these four aspects here burden of disease, therapy options, uh, precursors um, of acute leukemia, and, and some of the abnormal blood uh, patterns that may help with diagnosing both acute leukemia and other types of blood cancers. There is a survival gap for cancer overall in the UK where we're roughly 10% of 
lower than the rest of Europe and, and perhaps early diagnosis may help bridge that gap. Blood cancers overall contribute 5% um, of all types of cancers in the UK and of blood cancers you can see leukemia is probably the second most common type of blood cancer after non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The, the problem though is that although it's the fifth common type of cancer it has the third highest death rate so uh, really it's, it, it has a higher death rate than some of the more common cancers prostate and, and bladder and I suppose then that's the challenge we've got to try and help uh, improve um, survival rates by aiding early diagnosis. Um, infection was mentioned uh, by Charlotte as one of the key features of the campaign and, and I think it's important again to underline that cancer does account for the majority of patients who die of infection or sepsis um, in the UK uh, and so you know un, un, um, unusual infections would be um, a very good way of trying to exclude or at least think about an underlying blood cancer as a possibility. Um, so we know 65% of patients with acute leukemia present as an emergency. We know that uh, over a third of patients with myeloma in the UK present as an emergency. And the problem with this is that the survival of those patients presenting as an emergency is significantly lower than those patients presenting um, uh, as a uh, um, as a non-emergency case. So trying to push those emergency cases to non-emergency cases uh, would be very important. The other reason that would be important is because here you can see the number of drugs licensed for blood cancers just in, in 2017 is, is pretty remarkable. But then actually when you look at 2018, that's even more remarkable. There's even more drugs, particularly for blood cancers that have become available. Uh, and this pipeline of new therapies um, it continues to expand so the number of treatment options available for patients with blood cancers um, continues to improve and, and therefore making sure patients uh, receive an early diagnosis and therefore access to these um, therapies would be important. If we step back a bit and just think about blood cancers in general whether you have leukemia or myeloma or lymphoma the treatment paradigm would be some form of therapy which would be standard of care or clinical trial to induce a remission or response. In those patients who have refractory disease, they would again receive a clinical trial or my area of interest, which is cellular therapy uh, with chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy or CAR T-cell therapy. Uh, and then once they've achieved a response, then you can consolidate that response to reduce the risk of relapse. Uh, or improve progression-free survival with a transplant, whether that's autologous using the patient's own stem cells or allogeneic using somebody else's stem cells. And, and that broad treatment paradigm is, is how we treat all blood cancers. Um, the thing to bear in mind uh, is that Charlotte mentioned the number of patients who are diagnosed with acute leukemia, particularly acute myeloid leukemia, that are elderly is significant. And therefore assessing the performance status of those patients would be important to help determine uh, how much treatment they can receive because the treatment would be considerably toxic. But what's interesting is that even when you look at patients who are in their 70s or 80s, you can see that those patients who have a performance status of zero or one, which generally is a good performance status, is, is actually still considerably high. So in fact, half of patients above the age of 70 still have a good performance status, sufficient perhaps to receive intensive, potentially curative therapy. If we look at the treatment paradigm for these patients, if you are deemed el uh, eligible for intensive treatment, i.e. you're fit enough to receive it because these therapies have a considerable toxicity cost, generally you, rece you will receive in induction type chemotherapy. And if you were achieve a response, you would either get consolidation therapy, uh, which will be chemotherapy based and perhaps maintenance therapy, or if you were at high risk of recurrence, then you would go on to receive an allergenic stem cell transplant. If you are somebody who has relapsed disease, or, or whether it's primary refractory or, or after a response is achieved, then you would have salvage therapy. And if you've got ALL, then perhaps you may receive salvage therapy in the form of CAR T cell therapy to achieve a response. And that may be your last line of treatment, or you then may go on to have further consolidative treatment uh, with a stem cell transplant using an unrelated dose. 
And, and that, that broad treatment paradigm describes patients who are generally able to withstand intensive treatment. If you think about transplantation, um, and we often see um, lots of appeals to try and find uh, suitable donors for patients that, that uh, are, going, are going for transplant. In the past, um, most patients would have to have a fully matched sibling donor, which accounts for just under a quarter of uh, potential transplants um, globally. But actually, nowadays, if there, an, if there isn't an unrelated fully matched donor, uh, we can now use a half-matched parent, child or sibling, or even umbilical cord stem cells from, um, from uh, unrelated donors. So in fact, now most people, uh, if not everybody, should be considered uh, suitable for transplant on the basis that there is a donor available, as long as they're fit enough for therapy and have achieved a sufficient response. And if you look at transplantation, as you get older, as the prevalence of particularly acute myeloid leukemia increases, you can see that the proportion of patients in their 60s and in their 70s is increasing as you go from 2007 all the way down to 2017. And that's for all disease indications, particularly acute leukemia. And let's say you're much older and you're not fit enough to receive intensive therapy and and therefore you don't have necessarily um, a, a treatment with curative potential. Nowadays, based on recently published data, you can receive oral um, inhibitors of apoptosis. Um, and these patients now will have a median survival of uh, almost 50 months. And you can see from the curves that the, the curve flattens out. Um, whereas in the past, most therapies would achieve improvement in progression-free survival with separation of curves between control and, and treatment and then those curves will come together but here you can see a difference uh, and furthermore we now have evidence that if these patients continue with maintenance therapy then that improves things even further so in fact the number of uh, treatment options for older patients where they um, in the past there have been very few treatment options available have significantly improved in recent years and if we look at new things that are coming online, uh, adoptive cellular therapy. This is where one uses the patient's immune system, um, modifies usually their T cells um, with gene knock-ins uh, to target the uh, uh, cancer cells by targeting a cell surface marker. Um, then now those therapies, um, most commonly CAR T cell therapies shown here, are now available uh, routinely for younger patients who have acute lymphoblastic leukemia where the disease burden is greatest. Um, and this outlines a number of different products that are available now to NHS patients. Um, and you can see on the left here, this looks like a normal activated T cell, uh, which now is redirected to target the patient's leukemia. So those advances now um, make it even more imperative to try and uh, make an early diagnosis such that patients can then receive timely therapy, uh, including new therapy, whether it's um, antibody-based or uh, chemotherapy-based or cellular therapy-based. And if we think about general practice, I think there are some unique challenges uh, which have already been mentioned. One is that uh, the caseload is very low. So um, an individual GP may come across acute leukemia uh, ALL in this case for childhood leukemia very infrequently. Similarly, uh, more frequent uh, blood cancers like myeloma, again, you, most GPs individually would come across these uh, infrequently. And so it's, it's difficult to gain experience with a low caseload. And because the, the, the disease presentation is very non-specific and often quite vague, um, it's very difficult sometimes to make a diagnosis, uh, particularly as we don't have any red flags to hang our hat on. So having a low threshold um, and a high index of suspicion uh, is, is perhaps the most important thing to remember uh, when uh, blood cancers and, and particularly acute leukemia are, are considered. Uh, and um, recently reviewed by Randav um, in general practice, um, he found that increasing uh, workload in general practice and particularly uh, implications and concerns about missing cancer diagnosis uh, and, that, and really handling difficulties in, in handling that uncertainty and the lack of uh, clear safety, neck, uh, safety netting actually makes it very difficult uh, for individual GPs uh, to, to think about blood cancers and to make a diagnosis of a blood cancer. So I think 
the, the take home message here would be really just to maintain a high level of awareness, knowing that actually on an individual basis, the caseload is going to be uh, relatively low. If we then focus on the blood counts, um, NICE has issued guidance um, with respect to adults and young children and teenagers. And these symptoms really chime with uh, what uh, is outlined in the spot leukemia campaign. And here, the message is to do an urgent blood count, which will uh, betray the diagnosis in most cases of acute leukemia in anyone who has uh, pallor or um, fatigue or fever, uh, infections or anyone who has evidence of low platelets or, or a coagulation disturbance. Generalized lymphadenopathy is on the list. It's not a, a common feature of acute leukemia, but it can sometimes be found in, in T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias in particular. Hepatosplenomegaly is sometimes found in patients who have secondary acute leukemias, uh, particularly acute myeloid leukemias that um, are related to a pre-existing other blood cancer, for example, myeloid fibrosis. And in children, it's important not to um, uh, discount unexplained bone pain because that, that's an unusual symptom and can be a symptom of leukemia, particularly acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and the other thing I think is important to remember is even if someone has got another cause for low blood counts, such as vitamin deficiency or infection or autoimmune disease, those patients can still have acute leukemia. So uh, it's important just to maintain a high index of suspicion and perhaps uh, still consider referring these patients if, if there is uncertainty. So let's take um, the first pattern. The first pattern is a normal full blood count. Um, this can be associated with somebody who has a pre-leukemic condition such as myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, some patients who have uh, lymphoma presentations of acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, for example, a mediastinal mass, or a myeloid sarcoma, which is someone who's got acute myeloid leukemia with, uh, again, a mass presentation rather than a bone marrow presentation, or somebody who has um, um, a pre leukemic conditions such as myeloid fibrosis. All of these types of patients might have a normal blood count. Incidentally, most patients with lymphoma will have a normal blood count, as will patients who have um, myeloma or a precursor to myeloma, MGUS. Um, and we mentioned that there are pre-leukemic states. So these are states that can then lead to acute leukemia. So these are patients who have other myeloid cancers such as uh, essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, we mentioned myeloid fibrosis, but also chronic leukemias as well, like chronic myeloid leukemia and myeloid dysplastic syndrome. Um, now these patients can sometimes have a normal blood count uh, if they have um, um, clonal hematopoiesis with indeterminate potential CHIP, which is uh, a bit like MGUS as a precursor for myeloma. This is a precursor for a myeloid cancer, including acute leukemia. And uh, CCUS is um, cytopenias uh, of uh, undetermined um, significance. So these are patients who have um, CHIP but uh, and have cytopenias, but they don't really meet the diagnostic criteria for any of these other blood cancers shown here. And these patients can be diagnosed usually with a bone marrow um, to, to look for these mutations. So early diagnosis can occur and the monitoring of precursor lesions uh, uh, can also now be achieved. And this, this can start off with a uh, CHIP as the earliest lesion. And you can see from this diagram that patients who have CHIP um, most patients do not progress to any uh, blood cancer and will unfortunately die of other causes. But maybe up to 1% per year will progress to a form of myeloid blood cancer, whether it's, whether it's myeloid dysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia, another myeloid blood cancer, or occasionally a lymphoid blood cancer, uh, including ALL. And I've just sort of outlined the um, different subtypes of, of MDS there. So just to reiterate, CHIP is where you have uh, someone who's got normal hematopoiesis in the bone marrow, who then develops a mutation here. And then if that mutation causes the blood counts to fall, that's called CHIP, associated with cytopenias of undetermined significance. And if those patients then start developing changes in their bone marrow uh, that meet a diagnostic criterion for myeloid dysplastic syndrome, acute myeloid or another myeloid cancer, then those patients again need to be monitored much more closely. Um, and you don't have to go sequentially between these steps. You can skip steps uh, and go straight, for example, from CHIP to MDS or CHIP to acute myeloid leukemia. 
The other reason these patients are important is, let's say you've got this precursor lesion, but then you get the more common cancer, for example, breast cancer, and you receive chemotherapy for that. What that chemotherapy does is it selects out those clones that were precursors to acute leukemia, and then it allows those clones to then progress much more quickly. So then you can develop secondary or therapy related acute myeloid leukemia on the back of a previous cancer that required chemotherapy. If we look at how common this is in the population, so this is um, someone who's got a mutation without an abnormal blood count, you can see that actually if you're, at the, if you're uh, 40 or greater, about 2% of the population has it. If you're 60 or greater, 6% of the population has it. And if you're 70 or greater uh, or, or older, 14% of the population has it. So in fact, of the patients that um, are, are seen in general practice, a good proportion of patients will have these precursor mutations. The other reason it's important to identify them is there is a 40% increase in cardiovascular risk uh, with these patients. So even if they don't go on to develop secondary um, myeloid and acute myeloid leukemia, these patients do have a risk of uh, arterial disease with thrombosis, heart failure, and uh, atherosclerosis um, and its manifestations. So the second pattern to think about is those patients who have cytopenias, whether it's in one line or multiple lines, with or without a raised MCV. Now, now these patients, it's worth considering whether they have acute leukemia. If they've got coagulation disturbance, then they may have a specific form of acute leukemia called acute um, promyelocytic leukemia, which is an emergency. And that, that, pa that patient should get everyone out of bed and um, mandate a, uh, an emergency hospital admit admission. So it's important not to miss those patients because they have a uh, almost 100% death rate if they are um, uh, presenting late. Patients who um, may have uh, precursor lesions to acute leukemia, such as myelodysplastic syndrome or CCAST, as we've mentioned, may also present like this. Occasionally, patients with some forms of lymphoma can present like this, or some forms of advanced myeloma can present like this, but really, um, acute leukemia should be at the forefront of your mind in this setting. If you look at the burden of acute leukemia, you can see that this is increasing, particularly in older patients um, for acute myeloid leukemia, just over 3,000 patients are diagnosed every year, and the lifetime risk is 0.5%, and that, that, that there is an increasing trend over time. If you look at acute liverblastic leukemia, just under 1,000 patients are diagnosed every year, mostly in children, and the lifetime risk of that is orders of magnitude lower at 0.1%, but both of these two forms of acute leukemia can present similarly with one or more line um, cytopenias. If you look at the disease burden again here, you can see emphasizing AML is, an, is, is found in older patients, particularly male patients, um, whereas ALL is found more in younger patients. But if you look at uh, patients above the age of 25, you can see that there's a, there is a constant long tail of patients with a, a rise in older patients um, in, in the form of ALL as well. So it's important not to forget that. Uh, the different subtypes of AML and ALL I don't think are relevant to this talk, but this just gives you a flavour of how the different mutations and the genetic changes can help um, subcategorise these patients and help determine treatment options for them. I mentioned patients who have precursor lesions who then develop secondary leukaemia. Well, I show this graph to show that if you look at the solid lines compared to the dashed lines where patients have um, secondary or therapy-related disease. You can see for every disease category, patients who have therapy-related leukemia tend to have a worse outcome. Um, and the, the curve on the right just shows the different outcomes based on a different genetic subtypes uh, of, of leukemia. So you can see the survival outcome at 10 years can be between 81% and 3%. So very, very wide differences, uh, which um, mean that these patients will be offered different treatment options um, when, 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 they're, when they're diagnosed. So if we go to a case, 37-year-old patient presents to the, his uh, GP with lethargy, very non-specific symptom. There's a rash on the arms and the legs. When you look at the blood count, there is thrombocytopenia and anemia with a slight rise in Y count of 40, and that is associated with coagulation disturbance. Now, this patient, the most likely diagnosis here is acute myeloid leukemia, particularly acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is a subtype of acute myeloid leukemia. This patient needs to be admitted to hospital that day or that night if you're doing out of hours uh, um, covering shift because this patient will die of uh, uncontrolled hemorrhage without immediate 
um, treatment starting. Uh, patients with myelodysplastic syndrome won't get a rise in their white count. Patients with lymphoma may have a normal white count, or they may have a, um, some subclients might have a slightly elevated uh, white count, but they tend not to then have significant anemia or thrombocytopenia, and they may not have coagulation disturbance. Patients with ALL can present like this, but they tend not to have a coagulation disturbance. And again, with myeloma, we said there may be mild anemia, but you wouldn't otherwise see the other blood parameters or coagulation disturbance uh, being major features here. If you then think uh, about acute pronomyelocytic leukemia, as, as I mentioned, I'm emphasizing this as, a, as an emergency because these patients will unfortunately succumb to bleeding without um, a, a prompt diagnosis. The third pattern is patients who have a high white count with or without an associated uh, cytopenia. So this is the example I've just given you. So we know patients with acute leukemia uh, can present like this. Patients with minor fibrosis with spleen enlargement can present like this. And then there are a whole host of other subtypes which we, we don't need to go into uh, here, but uh, the patients can have isolated um, differential increases. The one important thing to think about here is patients who who have a gap between their total Y count and the differential. If you add up all the differential uh, parameters and if they don't add up to the Y count, there's a gap and those unmeasured cells are usually primitive or leukemic cells. So it's important if, the, if they're not flagged as leukemic cells in the, the results section of the full blood count, just to think if there are unmeasured cells, that patient should be referred for possible leukemia. And the way you would refer someone in Manchester at least and these are very similar um, pathways in, uh, all over the country, is if that patient has an abnormal blood count in the community, then that patient can be referred on the same day, or at least within 24 hours, to their haematology unit, either directly or via the A&E to the haematology unit. The patients can, of course, self-present if they have symptoms to A&E, and then they'll be referred to haematology, or they'll be referred directly within usually working hours to a haematology unit for workup. They, they will usually be sorted out within a day or so. And you can see the timelines here. So day zero, when they've got an abnormal, abnormal blood count, within two days, they'll have a bone marrow and all the rest of the tests to then possibly start treatment if they've got acute promyelocytic leukemia or tr start treatment in the number of days to come based on the genetic subtypes to then determine which treatment to give you, to, to, uh, which treatment to start given the different prognostic implications they have. So to summarize this point, um, patients who have a short history, usually within weeks, but sometimes within three months, patients who have features of bone marrow failure, typically leukemia infiltration, so that might be someone who's got anemia or symptoms of anemia like pallor, breathlessness, fatigue, chest pain, dizziness, or patients who have symptoms of low platelets, uh, perhaps with a rash, perhaps with bleeding or petechiae, or patients who have symptoms from low um, white cells, so leukopenia with ulcers in the mouth, unexplained persistent or unusual infections or fever, those are patients to consider um, a, a possible um, leukemia, possible underlying leukemia. And then symptoms of leukemia infiltration can also sometimes occur. So these are patients who have a, an inappropriate leukocytosis uh, with suppression of other cell lines. So a high white count with suppression of hemoglobin and platelets. Patients may also have bone pain or hepatosplenomegaly as other features, particularly in younger patients or patients who have secondary causes of acute leukemia. Um, now, this example is somebody who's got a um, non-specific presentation, again, to general practice with tiredness and lethargy, but now they've got splenomegaly. Um, and if you look at the blood count, you can see that all three cell lines are increased, hemoglobin, platelets, and um, white count. And you can see that mainly these are neutrophils. So patients like this tend to have a chronic leukemia rather than acute leukemia. And this, this patient ended up having a chronic myeloid um, leukemia rather than acute leukemia, because usually the pattern is a high white count with suppression of platelets and hemoglobin. Nonetheless, this is still someone that should be referred for uh, early diagnosis and management. Um, and again, um, these myeloproliferative neoplasms can, are outlined here. We can usually make a diagnosis quite easily by a number of um, mutation tests that we can do uh, in, in clinic. I don't think most of these are available in general practice, but uh, the reason I show these is these can 
progress from a chronic phase disease to a short accelerated phase to blast phase, which is essentially acute leukemia, where two thirds of patients will get acute myeloid leukemia and one third will get acute lymphoblastic leukemia, particularly if they've got CML. So again, these patients are worth fla uh, flagging and considering whether they have acute leukemia, even if they're known to have a chronic leukemia. So the pattern here is leukocytosis without cytopenia. Uh, and I've given some, some examples here. But just to take home, uh, think about um, patients with chronic leukemia who are progressing. So when you add up their total differential, does it add up to their white count? And if, they, if it doesn't, they've got unmeasured cells there and they're usually blasts. So those would tell you this, this patient's got acute leukemia and that patient should be referred on to hospital. And uh, it's important to think nearly 10,000 new patients with chronic leukemia are diagnosed. So these are patients at greater risk of progression to acute leukemia to then think about uh, referring on if you're worried, particularly if there is a change in their blood count. Um, and this is just to illustrate that most of the patients here are older with uh, some younger patients as well. So you can have precursors to B-cell lymphoma. So chronic lymphocytic leukemia is probably the commonest form of leukemia and it's a chronic leukemia. And we said this can progress to um, a, a more acute form, usually a, a form of lymphoma. But there is a precursor lesion called monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis. So again, you can make a diagnosis uh, with someone who's got isolated lymphocytosis and these patients can progress. Although, uh, again, like patients who have CHIP and like patients who have MGAS, most patients do not progress and will uh, unfortunately succumb to an unrelated condition. So when you think about B-cell cancers, you've got acute lymphoblastic leukemia here, which is mainly going to give you bone marrow related symptoms. Most of the lymphomas here will give you uh, non-bone marrow related symptoms. So usually the blood count won't be affected. And when you look at how these patients present in the community, so this is, an, this is a mega survey from general practice uh, with uh, nearly 30,000 patients that were surveyed. Um, most of these patients will present with lymphadenopathy with really a normal blood count. So you don't, if you haven't got an abnormal blood count, mo most of those patients are unlikely to have an acute leukemia. They're likely to have something else. And if there's lymphadenopathy, then these patients are likely to have uh, lymphoma. And it's again, worth, worth referring these patients for biopsy. So you can see here, just to illustrate the point, these patients don't tend to have a, an abnormal blood count here. And this is somebody, this is a group of patients who were uh, presenting in general practice who ended up eventually having Hodgkin lymphoma. So you can see the positive predictive value of a, of a, a, a platelet disturbance in this case was 0.04%. So it's not usually indicative of lymphoma, it's more indicative of leukemia. Um, this is an example of someone who's got um, myeloma. And it's again to illustrate the point that here, when you look at the blood count, there's mild anemia, normal white count, normal platelet count. So this is not someone who you would be particularly worried about having acute leukemia. Uh, they may have a pre-leukemic condition, uh, but certainly not someone who's got acute leukemia. Um, we mentioned MGUS as a precursor for myeloma, um, and it's also a precursor for some forms of lymphoma as well. So these patients can be picked up with a paraprotein. And of course, if you've got a paraprotein and an abnormal blood count, again, it's worth referring these patients uh, to diagnose a blood cancer, but these patients are not likely to have an acute leukemia. They, can, they could have MGUS myeloma, Wallenstrahl's macroglobulinemia, which is a form of uh, low-grade lymphoma or amyloid, but, but, lymph but um, acute leukemia is not usually the presentation here. Again, it's important to illustrate these patients with myeloma, uh, more than uh, 5,500 patients will be diagnosed new, newly every year. So that, you, know, you will come across these patients in the community, usually older patients and usually men. Um, the referral pathway for these patients is longer. You can see here that typically these patients can be referred on a, on a two-week rule rather than a, a two-day referral pathway that you'd expect for acute leukemia. So just to finish then, think about the patterns uh, that you might come across um, that may help you diagnose acute leukemia. That can either be someone with a normal blood count, perhaps with macrocytosis and a mutation. Mutation usually is detected on the bone marrow but can be found in the blood. Someone who's got cytopenias in one or more cell lines with or without um, an elevated MCV. Someone who's got leukocytosis, so um, that may be in one or more cell lines with suppression of other cell lines, either hemoglobin platelets or both. Someone who's got leukocytosis with an elevation in other cell lines, i.e. without suppression of other cell lines, uh, 
it's worth thinking about them as someone who's got chronic leukemia who then could progress to acute leukemia if there's a change and then patients who have lymphadenopathy without an abnormal blood count are less likely to have acute leukemia unless they have for example t-cell acute lymphoplastic leukemia with a mass typically in the chest or someone who's got myeloid sarcoma again with a mass elsewhere and these two groups tend not to have an abnormal blood count at the very beginning but have a mass patients who have a paraprotein tend not to have an acute leukemia they tend to have a b cell a more mature b cell cancer uh, with with myeloma or lymphoma being the commonest so i'm going to stop there and um, hand over thank you so much amit that was a huge amount of information covered very eloquently and effectively i think i'll certainly be needing to watch that back when it's on the college website and for anyone who's thinking the same it, it should be available in the next few weeks via the RCGP webinar um, section of the website. Um, but thank you so much. Um, keep posting questions in the chat and I'll, I'll put them to Amit at the end if that's okay. Um, so next up we have um, Dr. Richard Roop, who is the Cancer Research UK Senior Clinical Advisor, and he's also the RCGP Clinical Advisor for Cancer, and he's going to be talking about the GP perspective. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, real privilege to be with you and uh, looking forward to just presenting some of the issues that we face in general practice in the whole arena of leukemia. Uh, so if we could have the slide deck up, that would be really great. Thank you. So that's who I am. Uh, do follow me on Twitter if you're a, a tweeter. Uh, I generally only tweet cancer stories, occasionally a holiday snap, but mainly uh, cancery things. And uh, Likewise, I'd be very happy to follow you if you've got something to say. So next slide, please. Uh, so just going to be looking at the barriers to early diagnosis, uh, look at uh, why we're all turning up tonight and uh, looking at uh, blood cancers in particular. You'll have heard some of the data already, but uh, I don't see any harm in reinforcing that. So looking at how many, how often, how can we do better and what next? And next slide, please. So if you weren't aware, September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Interestingly, it's also Child Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, there's quite a big overlap with uh, both of those. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the league table of cancer prevalent, uh, so, sorry, cancer incidents. And this was in 2017, the last year we've got full data for. Uh, so if we can have the next slide please and there is the opportunity for a bit of interaction here um, so if we're just thinking about where blood cancer deaths might come to if they were all aggregated uh, and if you were listening carefully you'll have already heard the answer this evening uh, but if you think it comes after lung then vote lung if you think it comes between bowel and prostate vote bowel if you think it becomes between prostate and breast, vote prostate. If you think it comes between breast and pancreas, vote breast. And between pancreas and esophagus, vote pancreas. So if you'd like to quickly vote, that would be great. And then if we could see how you'll think it pans out, that would be great. Okay, so uh, obviously a lot of you were listening hard. Um, so the correct answer is it is, it comes after bowel so if we could have the next slide close down the poll and the next slide please and you can see it slots in there so that this is just the deaths from blood cancers and puts them in that uh, league table uh, for some reason uh, the statisticians in the cancer world keep blood cancers separate in this league table uh, which they don't do for other types of cancer and I think that's one of the reasons why blood cancers have not had the airtime that they deserve. Uh, 
in that it's broken down to all the different cancers, which then puts it further down in the lead table. And if we could have the next slide, please. If we break those blood cancers apart and look at the incidence of cause of death, we can see that the leukemias together come in second place just behind non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, but NHL, leukemia, myeloma are the, uh, the big three and then Hodgkin's comes in with 3%. And the next slide, please. If we then look at incidence, and this is the average over three years, again, we can see that leukemia is in second place to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, but it's a, a really big issue for uh, the cancer world and cancer numbers. And then if we can have the next slide, and this just shows how often as an eight session GP, you're likely to come across a case of each of those four types of blood cancer. Uh, so you can see that it, it's not particularly common. And to put it in context, uh, the big four, so lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer, you expect to see one of those each year. So on average, an eight session GP, we'll see about eight cancers in all a year. Uh, one each of the big four and then the other four will be others and the blood cancers combined will probably be one of those uh, as well. Next slide please. Again we heard this a little bit earlier. Uh, we know from the previous iteration of the National Cancer Diagnosis Audit which looked at uh, cancers diagnosed in 2014 that overall one in three people diagnosed with a blood cancer uh, consulted more than three times prior to referral. Uh, this doesn't include those who were a, an emergency presentation but hadn't seen their GP at all, and there are quite a few of those. Uh, to put that in context, it is a, a higher uh, fraction than all cancers combined, where it's just slightly below 25% of all cancer presentations will have seen their GP three times or more prior to referral with the, the associated symptoms. But for breast cancer, it's as low as 1 in 16, which I guess is fairly self-evident. Uh, next slide, please. And again, Amit introduced this. This is from the NICE guidance NG12, which I think GPs are increasingly aware of. And these list the uh, significant symptoms uh, that, if present, would provoke a two-week, or if you're in one of the devolved nations, an urgent cancer referral. Uh, the NG12 set a positive predictive value threshold of 3%. So if your symptom cluster or symptoms with investigation results puts your risk of having a specific cancer at over 3%, uh, obviously it may be more than that, but if it's over that 3% mark, that then generates a two-week referral. Uh, next slide, please. In the COVID season, when we're doing all our remote consulting, particularly important that if patients are reporting that they've uh, got lumps in their axillae or in their groins, it's probably a good case that you need to meet up with them and have one of those, uh, what I regard almost as a privilege now, a face-to-face -face consultation, uh, which can lighten the day from screen gazing all day. Uh, again, it's unlikely that a, a patient would uh, complain of having uh, an enlarged liver or an enlarged spleen, but they may report bloating or something of that sort. So really important where your suspicions are aroused that you do bring them in and check them out. And next slide, please. And as we heard from Amit's presentation, any adult with those symptoms where you're concerned, you need to arrange a full blood count urgently. And that may involve having it done in-house depending on uh, your system. Certainly in where I'm in practice, if we had patients such as this, if it was prior to the blood collection pickup, uh, the GP uh, partner or registrar may actually take the blood test themselves. Uh, but really important to get those off quickly. And next slide, please. And in the children and young adults, any uh, petechiae, or if you detect any enlargement of liver or spleen, then uh, contact your paediatric team and get an immediate referral off. And next slide, please. 
and for again for the children and young adults uh, if they have symptoms other than petechiae and hepatitis megaly and any of those listed uh, worthwhile doing a full blood count persistent fatigue in a child is uh, pretty rare uh, and certainly worth doing a full blood count uh, i guess the commonest cause may be glandular fever particularly if they've got lymphadenopathy as well but very worthwhile doing that full blood count to pick out an early uh, leukemia and uh, next slide please uh, one of the things that I learned at medical school and uh, we discovered a few years ago is that concept of three strikes and you're in. Um, so if you get a parent coming back with a child who has previously not been a particularly high attender and they've come three times in a fairly short uh, space of time with recurrent sort of repetition of the same symptoms, really start to think, is there something serious going on? And a full blood count is a very good place to start. And next slide, please. And the key to cancer, and next slide please, it's the old adage of education, education, education. And if we pull up the next slide, public patients and professions. So you're all here tonight, so we're taking the uh, third of those, but it's important that the public are aware of those symptoms and the spot leukemia is playing a big part in that. And the next slide, and then the next one, also good for our policymakers and politicians to be aware, if we're going to deliver good care, we need lots of GPs and we need more GPs. And interestingly, one of the consequences of the complete debacle with A-level results is that we may well get more medical students coming through. Certainly a couple of the med schools are going to admit anyone who got the grades they were given an offer on. Uh, so there may be just a, a very thin silver streak, so that rather dark cloud. And the next slide, please. Uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Next slide, please. There's a quote of Albert Einstein. If we're going to do things uh, better, we need to start doing things differently. Uh, one of the things we know is the value of the GP's sixth sense or the gut reaction. So if you see a patient and you just get a, a random alarm bell ringing, thinking, goodness, this person looks really poorly, then it's certainly worth doing a full blood count at the earliest opportunity. And the next slide, please. So looking forward as to what's coming up next, uh, the NHS long-term plan, which only applies to our England guests. Uh, tonight, uh, the Rapid Diagnostic Centre rollout is underway, and this will address that gut reaction and sixth sense that uh, GPs have, and it addresses the non-site-specific symptoms. And in the pilots, what we've been seeing is there have been quite a few leukemia diagnoses coming through the rapid diagnostic centers and the next slide please this just summarizes where we've been over the last few minutes and the next slide please and that's me done thank you richard um, so any questions for richard pop them in the chat and we'll come to those um very soon after our final speaker who is um, Dr. Barbara Competus, who is a GP and she's also a trustee for leukemia care. And she's going to be speaking to us this evening about the family perspective. Over to you, Barbara. Yeah, thank, thanks, Lily. And um, just a big thank you to everyone for giving up this their time this evening um, for taking part in this webinar. Um, as Lily mentioned, I'm a GP myself, but I'm here this evening. Um, as a daughter um, and to talk about my mum. Um, so mum is, uh, was, <laughs> uh, a fit and healthy 65 year old. Um, she had recently retired and was living life to the full. And the last thing that we expected was for mum to become one of the emergency admission statistics in relation to leukemia. Um, so mum was diagnosed with acute promyelocytic leukemia, which um, Emmett had talked about. Um, so for us, and for me as a GP, I, I'd never heard of it before, and it came as quite, quite a shock. And as Emmett alluded to, mum sadly died the day that she was diagnosed. Um, so for us, that was obviously quite a shock. Um, and looking back in retrospect, there were a few symptoms or signs that really suggested that that was the case. 
And the reason I'm sharing my story really is as a daughter and as a colleague, because I want to be part of the Spot Leukemia campaign. I want to be part of this webinar to raise awareness because I really don't want the experience I had with leukemia to be the experience that other families have. Um, and it's really difficult to put into words the impact it had on my family. And just wanted to say what a difference GPs can make if it's on their radar. Um, so mum didn't recognise the symptoms as acute leukaemia. Her friends didn't recognise her symptoms as leukaemia. And her GP didn't recognise her symptoms. She did see her GP a few days before she was admitted to hospital. I'm not, this isn't about blame. This, I don't think anything would have changed in terms of her, her outcome. But I just don't think it was on their radar, like it wasn't on her friends or her or her family's radar, really. So it's really just to say that leukemia is, is sneaky and it's a mimic. And as, GP, as GPs, it overlaps with so many conditions that we see every single day. And it's really just about putting it on your radar. Uh, chances are, when you see someone with the symptoms and signs that have been described this evening, they don't have leukemia. But it's just really about raising awareness and just putting it on your radar because the symptoms can be explained away you know mum explained away her tiredness um she thought it was a rage uh mum explained away the fact that she was a little bit breathless again just because of her age um and she saw a gp in december in the middle of flu season and a gp thought she had flu and that was that so um and obviously it wasn't any of those things it was acute leukemia there isn't any blame in what I'm saying. I just wanted to share my story, really. And I heard about leukemia care via their spot leukemia campaign after mum had died, after I was trying to process what happened and trying to look for something positive to do in the wake of such a devastating occurrence, really. Uh, so I'm a trustee at leukemia care and I work with leukemia care and really support their work in providing information, education and support for professionals and patients. And, you know, that's the reason I'm here. I, as a charity, they do great work. And, you know, I, I listen to the patient stories and how hard it is. And it's, it's no, no easier for me to talk, but I think it's really important if somehow me sharing my story puts that little flag in your brain. So our brains are overloaded and overburdened with all kinds of things that we're thinking of, especially in this COVID world that we live in. And I really just wanted to try and put a little flag in your mind that just said, you know what, could it be leukemia? And luckily we have tools readily available to us to check. And I know that there are some instances where the blood count will be normal which have been highlighted but in the vast majority of cases if the blood count is normal and the examination is normal then it won't be but I guess I just really wanted to put it in your mind because because one day you might think of this webinar and pick up a case that you maybe wouldn't have done before so I really just wanted to say thank you for participating and obviously I'm happy to answer any questions and hope that this webinar and the support from leukemia care has helped raise awareness of this disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. So sorry to hear about your mum and thank you for your courage in coming and talking to us about that today. That must have been incredibly hard and I'm sure everyone extends their thanks for, for you doing so and I'm sure you're right. I'm sure that you know, that personal story will add that extra flag to us when we're seeing patients presenting with these symptoms. So really appreciate it. Um, so thank you to all our fantastic speakers. Um, we're going to have, so we've got about 20 minutes left this evening. So we'll spend the rest of the time doing some questions and answers if that's okay. Um, so do post a few more on the chat and we'll try and get to them. Um, so Barbara, just to say lots of comments coming through there saying, Thank you so much. Very brave presentation. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you for sharing your touching story. So hopefully you can see those comments there. Um, OK, so our first question um, is for Amit, if that's OK. And 
I was going to ask exactly the same question. So thank you, Laura Williamson, for putting this one forward. How do we know if patients have CHIP if they have a normal full blood count? So the only way you can diagnose CHIP is if you've found a mutation. And you then ask, well, why would you have the test done in the first place if your count is normal? Um, in practice, most of these patients will have some macrocytosis that's unexplained. So, that, you know, there's no alcohol, there's no liver issue, there's no thyroid problem. There's, there's nothing else that you can think of that might be causing it. Um, and these patients may then be referred for investigation, which will include a blood uh, count and may include a bone marrow. The blood, particularly the bone marrow, but also the blood can be interrogated for mutations. Now, if that patient then is found to have a mutation, but actually doesn't have a blood cancer diagnosis that you can make on, on the material you have in the <coughs> marrow, then that patient will be labeled as CHIP. So in the community, you wouldn't know someone has CHIP. You would refer someone with unexplained macrocytosis in, in the vast majority of patients. Um, and, and that would be how you would ever end up with a diagnosis of a CHIP. Um, but it's important to consider these patients may not just have chip, they just may have full-blown myelodysplastic syndrome or um, they may have <coughs> a form of leukemia where mainly the presentation is, is outside the bone marrow um, and of course they could have um, lymphoma or myeloma as well. So these patients with normal counts with unexplained macrocytosis of which you must see lots, you know, they can they can be problematic because they can be early manifestations of leukemia or a blood cancer diagnosis. So you're <coughs> right, we do see lots. And so how do we, and obviously we're under pressure not to refer too many people to secondary care and obviously secondary care is very busy as well. We recognize that. Which ones do we refer? What sort of levels? When should we be repeating a test if we just get an abnormal MCV? and? Yeah normal full blood count, what would be your advice on that? So those patients you can repeat every three months because the, the, the uh, pace is not going to be quick usually for those, for those patient groups. You wouldn't normally refer somebody like that on a two-week rule, um, but you would refer them perhaps um, to a haematologist if all other things that you would have access to testing in the community have been exhausted, vitamin levels, thyroid levels, uh, liver enzymes and so on. And then those patients will be worked up by the hematologist. If there is a high index of suspicion, so let's say you have access to a blood film and that's come back to say, you know, there are abnormal neutrophils or something about something vague like that, then that patient could go on a two-week rule because that patient is then at higher risk of having a myeloid blood cancer to, to acute leukemia. Yeah. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, and then another question also for Amit um, from Charlotte Tovey. Um, the question is, why is it that the UK has a survival gap compared with other European countries? What are the UK specific challenges? I think that's the million dollar question the government's trying to grapple with. And I think that's partly why the, um, they've developed this um, uh, rapid diagnostic centre initiative as well as um, the NHS England Cancer Plan to try and increase the number of patients that have an earlier stage diagnosis rather than a late stage diagnosis. It's thought the, the, over, the majority of that is, is contributed to late diagnosis, late stage diagnosis, and therefore fewer treatment options and fewer effective treatment options. Um, that, that's thought to be the main, the main reason for that. And so from a, you know, a leukemia and a blood cancer point of view, the spot leukemia type uh, initiative, I think it chimes very well with that to try and get people to a, an earlier diagnosis and an earlier treatment because um, I showed you um, some of the different new treatment options and also some of the genetic subtypes. Actually, some acute leukemias have a 95% five-year survival rate, cure rate. So that, that can be quite, you know, quite dramatic with an early diagnosis, but with a late diagnosis, they can have a case fatality rate north of ninety-five percent. So it's it's a very um, it's it's a it's a very wide um, gap there between uh, what you can achieve with an early and a late diagnosis. Thank you. Um, 
That's very helpful. Okay, so the next question we have is for Richard, um, and that's from Helen Poulter. So the question is, if a patient has NICE guideline 12 consistent symptoms, but then subsequently has normal bloods, would you still refer on a two week wait pathway? Uh, so it would really depend on what other symptoms they had, but if you use the uh, NG12, there's a really helpful uh, add-on developed by Ben Noble, who's one of the CRUK GPs. So if you go onto NG12, you can get a link through to it, or Gateway C also has a link where you can put in the patient demographics and their bundle of symptoms, and that will then tell you whether they qualify, quote unquote, for a two-week wait referral for any of the site-specific pathways. If you're in an area that has an RDC and they don't fulfill a two-week wait criteria site-specific pathway, they may well then fulfill the RDC pathway. So if you haven't come across that really helpful uh, link from the NG12, worth going onto Gateway C or going through the NG12 website itself. Thanks, Richard, that's very helpful. Um, okay, and another question for you from Rachel War. Um, for a lymphoma diagnosis in patients who present with B symptoms, is there a risk of being falsely reassured by a normal full blood count? Are they likely to have lymphadenopathy or an enlarged liver spleen if you examine for it? How would I not miss these patients? Yeah, always going to be difficult. And I think the whole area where you, we're not helped by the uh, investigations can be challenging. Uh, but if you do find a lymphadenopathy, or particularly if you notice hepatosplenomegaly, then those are qualifying criteria for a two week wait referral. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat just a minute or so ago, locally we have the advice and guidance and our local haematologists are amazing in being very supportive there. So if you do have a query where you think someone may not quite fulfill the criteria, advice and guidance is a good route to follow if you have that locally available. And is it worth doing a chest x-ray looking for hyaluronic lymphadenopathy? Yeah, and the chest x-rays can be helpful. And certainly if you have uh, tiredness as a symptom and shortness of breath, you're maybe thinking about lung cancer anyway. So a chest x-ray is a good workup for those, uh, particularly for the sort of non-site specific symptoms. So uh, I would have a pretty low th threshold of concern for getting a chest x-ray as a sort of, as a general workup. So your sort of standard uh, blood test, so full blood count, uh, bone profile, liver function, urine, e, and a chest x-ray is a really good place to start. Great, thank you. Um, and then a question um, for anyone really, um, from Karjan Yip, should the GP refer the deranged full blood count to haematology urgently without repeating it or doing a blood film? Who'd like to answer that one? Do you want me to take that, Lily? Yes, that's great. Um, I think it just depends on what the pattern of the derangement is. Um, if the pattern is somebody who has a white, uh, you know, a, a, a high white count with suppression of other cell lines, so uh, significant anemia or thrombocytopenia, then then the answer I would say yes, that patient should go uh, urgently. I think if the pattern is somebody who has one uh, cell line, particularly a white cell line that's deranged, so down, then that patient should also be on that urgent list. For patients who have other cell lines that are down, or patients where all three cell lines are up, those patients, you know, I said, are less likely to have an, an acute leukemia type presentation. So they need to go, but you could, you do have time to, to repeat the, the count. Um, but I think, as, as um, you know, Richard mentioned, the, it'd be worth just picking up the phone really to the local haematologist to, to ask, you know, do they want to see the patient now or do they want to see the patient after the count's been repeated? And I have to say, I normally just say send the patient. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the different areas will have different pressures. But it's, it's the pattern, I think, that's the key. You know, how, what is your mix of suspicion and how likely is it that this patient's going to have... Uh, a rapidly progressing form of acute leukemia. And is there a resource, a kind of go-to quick glance summary of, of the abnormalities that you can recommend for us? 
Um, I suppose Charlotte may be able to say something about that in terms of what Leukemia Care have and Gateway C have. Um, I don't think the, the, the British Society for Hematology have um, a resource as well. But the problem is a lot of those um, are slightly too post-diagnosis, if you like. You know, the, the, probably what you need is something that's vague enough of, similar to the presentation of the patient you see. And actually, there's not a lot for, the, for, the, for that presentation. Leukemia Care Habit Gateway C have those scenarios, which had mentioned the sort of calculator that you can use. But um, th those are the only ones that, that are available. We have very little else because of the non-specific nature of the, the symptoms. And actually, as has already been highlighted, most patients will have something else for the, for the less common types of acute leukemia presentations. But the, the, the index of suspicion, as long as it's high enough, and either you've got a very high count with evidence of bone marrow failure or just broad bone marrow failure without a high count, those are, those are pretty strong features of someone who has acute leukemia. And just to build on what Alan said then in terms of our resources, so the uh, e-learning courses that we've already got with Gateway C and RCGP and the upcoming new ones that focus specifically on chronic and acute um, they all have both case studies, but also should talk you through the process of what to look for in the full blood cancer. Hopefully that um, is sufficient, but we would welcome feedback on anything of any other resources we could create for GPs. Um, it's definitely something we'd look for and please do get in touch with us if, if there's something you think we could make that would be useful for you. Thank you, Charlotte. So people are mentioning in the chat there that the Buku um, Hematology app is, is, is really useful. Um, I don't know if many of you have looked at that before, but I've certainly used it before and it is very helpful. But yes, certainly, I think when we're, when we're rushed and we've got 50 abnormal blood results, I think just having something we can glance at quickly is, is always very useful rather than having to kind of hunt through guidelines or lots and lots of case studies but I appreciate it's hard to get everything into one table and um, Laura Williamson's just saying they've also just added a renal section which is really good too um, and Joe Kinghorn is asking where we can get the e-learning again Charlotte and um, we'll, if you wouldn't mind letting Claire know the um, the link for that and then we can circulate it with the um, with the email that Claire's going to send to everyone as a follower yep Claire's got those so hopefully you'll be able to find your way through but if you you can't please email us and we'll direct you from there perfect so i think that is all of the questions that we've been asked in the chat unless anyone wants to to put any final ones in there or does does any, do any of the speakers have any closing statements or important take-home messages yeah I, I just think follow your instincts i think uh one of the joys of general practice is that we get to know our patients and if you see a sudden increase in consultation rates, just have your ears pricked and uh, be ready just to chase down that sort of just that uneasy feeling that we sometimes get uh, because there's increasing research to show that the GP gut reaction or sixth sense has a very high positive predictive value for cancers. Thank you, Richard. Absolutely. Charlotte, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, um, obviously, I've talked at length about both the GP and the public awareness side. And if um, anybody has sort of contacts with their CCG or trust or any way we could get the message out to the broader public as well. Um, we think it's important to have both aspects. And if anybody wants to get involved in the public awareness side of things, please do get in touch with us. Um, the link to the general campaign page will be coming afterwards if you are interested. Great. Thank you. So, um, yes, that, that sums up nicely. Um, someone said leukemia and lymphoma are intimidating subjects. Many thanks. I think you've you've done them justice tonight. Uh, four fantastic speakers and um, yes, the really, really relevant, really important topic. And thank you so much. We've had over 140 people join. So that's fantastic. So just finally, there's a, a poll there on your screen in front of you. Please do um, give us a bit of feedback and um, helps us shape future sessions as well as some feedback for the speakers um, tonight. Um, and thank you all for joining us. <laughs>
I'll give this poll another minute and then I'll close down the meeting. Is this a good time? Yeah. Yes, yes, thanks. Um, I think that might have been a telephone call.